to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, so if you find the middle of the Bible, is the book of Psalms. Just right about the middle is the book of Psalms. Right up to that is Proverbs, and then there's a shorter book, Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon, the king, and uh, near the end of his life, he wrote this down. Uh, a very interesting book. Uh, it's not a very positive book. You know, if we, as you read through it, you'll you'll notice that it's uh, it's almost a little discouraging. Uh, he, you know, he every chapter he kind of deals with something that won't satisfy. Now, if we look at it from the other side, it can be very encouraging because it reminds us that things of this life will never satisfy. If we think about who Solomon himself was, uh, if you know anything about biblical history, and Solomon was the son of David, and so he became king after David was king. And the Bible tells us that Solomon was one of the wisest men that ever lived. He was one of the richest men that ever lived. Uh, there, there was nothing that Solomon was denied. You know, as far as when we think about earthly goods or things of this world, Solomon had it all. He was king. He was rich. Uh, you know, he didn't lack for women. If you know the history of Solomon, uh, was it uh, 700 wives and 300 concubines? Uh, I mean, I've often kind of joked and said, you know, you, if you have that many wives, you kind of have to be the richest man alive because how do you buy that many shoes? I mean, when you've got a thousand wives, can you imagine? He had to have warehouses of shoes and purses and, you know, those fancy dresses for formal occasions and all that. Um, so, you know, kind of tongue-in-cheek, I thought he had to be the richest man alive because you couldn't shoe that many women. It sounds like a horse, doesn't it? Shoeing horses, shoeing women. Anyway, I should move on before we get in trouble. Um, but Solomon had everything. And when we read the book of Ecclesiastes, he, he talks very much about that. He says, you know, I, I tried this, and I found it to be vanity. I did this, and the end of it was vanity. I mean, he even talked about riches. He said, what is the benefit if I gain all of these riches... When I die, I can't take them with me, and I'm going to leave them to my children. How do I know that they're going to be wise? How do I know that they're going to use it the way, you know, it should be used? And, I mean, the world is filled with examples of that, right? Somebody who was wealthy, earned the money, worked hard, built a business, and then their children, within a generation, the business is gone, the name is forgotten, the... You know, the riches are nowhere to be found. Uh, and as far as I understand, that's kind of a problem in some places in England. They, people that had these like big old houses and land and all that, but they have no money to upkeep and to maintain that. And they're, they're kind of like land rich, but financially poor. And, uh, you know, turning stuff into hotels or whatever, trying to, to kind of keep this familial heritage that they can't afford. Why? Well, somebody didn't know how to manage what was managed well. Previously, Solomon said, all that is empty. And we're in Ecclesiastes 5, if you find your way there. In the midst of all of this, we find Solomon talking about our mouths, our tongue, our, our speech. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, from verse number 1. Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. And just let it sink in what Solomon even says, opening our mouths is. Right? He makes that comparison. Be more ready to hear than to what? To give the sacrifice of fools. There's some other places in Scripture, in the book of Psalms, book of Proverbs, I think also mentions this, well, we talk, where they, the psalmist will speak about making the sacrifice of our lips, speaking in context of praising God, the sacrifice of our lips. And here Solomon makes reference to, sadly, what many times happens when we open our mouths, we give the sacrifice of fools. 
Verse 2, be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. For a dream cometh through the multitude of busyness, and a fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands? For in the multitude of dreams and many words, there are also diverse vanities, but fear thou God. Now, I know Solomon speaks of a few things within the, this uh, portion of Scripture, but over and over again we see him speaking about our mouth, about our words, about the things that we say. Uh, even there in verse 3, For a dream cometh through the multitude of busyness, and a fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. Uh, I don't know if it's the case for you, but I do find that when I am the most busy and I'm doing this and that and I'm stressed about things, I tend to have very strange dreams uh, when those things occur, when I, I just have a lot going on and I'm stressed and I'm not sleeping well. And, you know, that, that's when I have those, you know, very, very strange, surreal, odd dreams. You know, I know people try to put way too much thought into what does that mean that, you know, you dream this or that, you know, it's kind of, well, yes, I was, uh, I dreamed that I was, you know, a cat that could speak, and, you know, I was in charge of a business, and everybody that came in was a rabbit, you know, what does that mean? It means you ate some bad pizza before you went to bed, you're too stressed out, you need to sleep more, but it is true, kind of that stress and busyness, it does lead to dreaming, it, it leads to all kinds of things, and then Solomon goes on and says, and a fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. You probably have heard the, the old adage before, right? better to be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. And, uh, you know, it's kind of the same idea here. A fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. If you keep your place here and turn just back a little bit to Proverbs chapter 29, not too far from Ecclesiastes 5, probably just a few pages there, Proverbs chapter 29, in verse number 11. Proverbs 29, verse 11, A fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keepeth it in till afterward. Maybe we've all been guilty of this. We certainly probably all know someone who does this, right? They they just, I mean, they open their mouth and it's like a, a never-ending fountain. They just say everything that comes to mind, everything they're thinking, everything they've experienced in their life. I, mean, I don't know if you've ever met somebody like that where, I mean, you sit down with them and next thing you know, I mean, it's three hours later and you know more about their life than you ever wanted to know. Uh, you might even be a little bit uncomfortable about, about what they have shared. The Bible says, a fool uttereth all his mind. And as Solomon was speaking back here in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, a dream cometh through the multitude of busyness, and a fool's voice is known by multitude of words. A fool's voice is known by multitude of words. This is why I believe Solomon starts the chapter with the statement, be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools. You know, again, you've probably heard, right? You know, God gave us one mouth and two ears. We're supposed to listen twice as much as we speak. Um, I was kind of rude as a child, and I often said, yes, but the holes in my ears are way smaller than the hole in my mouth. So, you know, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that means I should talk more. But a, a fool is known. Right? I mean, just, a fool 
whose voice is known how? Not necessarily by what he speaks. You know, the, not known by the quality of what he speaks, but by the quantity of what he speaks, by the multitude of words. In the New Testament, the Bible tells us in a multitude of words there wanted not sin. Maybe that's sort of the Old Testament. Uh, Jesus Christ said that you know man is known, or our heart is known by the things that we speak. But that in a multitude of words there wanteth not sin. If we think about that even in our own lives, right? I don't know about you, but I can say for me for sure, the more I speak, the more I'm at risk of saying something dumb, offensive, wrong, incorrect. I mean, just it just happens. But recently, um, I should probably, none of you know Julia Owens, but the Owens family, the missionary, another missionary family here in Bulgaria, their daughter just moved back to the United States to begin Bible college. And she started Bible college in January. And there, uh, she met a girl in Bible college who knows us from a mission trip we did in 2019 in, uh, in the Ukraine. And apparently I traumatized this poor girl. I, I don't know what I said or what I remembered, but Julia was talking with her and apparently they, they started sh sharing stories of, of the cruel things that I've said to them now jokingly and, and in love. I've told people often, if I don't make fun of you, I don't care about it. That's uh, it's how I show love, uh, but I'm sure I said something to this girl, and in a multitude of words, there wanteth not sin. I said maybe as I read this passage, it's more for me than you. I don't know. Uh, it spoke to me because I need to remember this. Uh, if we turn over to the book of James in the New Testament. The book of James, you'll find it right after the book of Hebrews. If you hit John and Peter, you went too far. The book of James, chapter 3. James, chapter 3. Verse number 1, my brethren... Be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For, for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Now, you know, the wording there might be a little strange, a, a little archaic. The be not many masters, uh, we, we could say... You know, in our, our modern language, we would say, don't strive to be a teacher. And he said, well, I, I thought being a teacher would be a great thing. Why, why would James say, my brethren, be not many masters? And he said, why should I not strive to be a teacher? Shouldn't I learn as much as I can so I can share it with others? Now, that is a good thing. And, and even Paul writes about that. He says, you know, if a man desire the office of a bishop, that is, if someone desires to be a pastor, someone who's going to teach the word of God to others, Paul said he desires a good thing. But here James says, be not many masters. That is, don't strive to be in this position. But listen, James has a different perspective. He, he's looking at it from another side. Yes, it's a good calling. It's a good desire to want to teach others the word of God. But what James points out here is that knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. See, we're responsible for what we teach. As he says, for in many things we offend all. Those who are in that position to teach are forced to use more words. And thus they're in danger. Why? Because our tongues are very hard to control. As James continues, 
Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths, verse 3, that they may obey us. And we turn about their whole body. He's given us this example here. If you know much about horses, if you've seen that bit that you put in a horse's mouth, in a well-trained horse, it's very small. In the beginning, they use a bigger bit as they're training the horse. But over time, they can use a smaller bit and, until... It's really almost just, just a slight tug. That horse instantly knows which way to turn, which way to go. It's a very small thing in their mouth, and yet with that you can control this large and very strong animal. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm whithersoever the governor listeth. Again, if you, I mean, your brother is in the Navy, right? The, the British Navy, or British Royal Navy, I'm sorry, get the wording right here. Those are massive ships they have. I mean, I understand they have small ones, but you, know, you think about these container ships and these cruise liners that carry, I mean, like a, I, I, there was a, kind of like a reality documentary series that was shown in the United States several years ago uh, about life aboard these aircraft carriers in the U.S. Navy. And uh, they, they, call them, they call them like floating cities. I mean, one, when you think about a ship that's long enough to land a plane on, I understand they've, they've got some technology to allow the planes to not need as much space, but still, they land planes on them, and planes take off from them, and they store multiple planes in the ship. I mean, when you just talk about space for multiple planes, that's a decent amount of space, but there's thousands of people working and living on these ships, and yet a ship that massive has a very small helm. If, if you were to look at the rudder on that ship in comparison with the rest of the ship, it's very small. Very small. And yet the entire ship is turned about by that very small thing. And so James, as he continues in verse 5, even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindled. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. James doesn't have much nice to say about our tongue. For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is unruly evil, full of deadly poison. I think all of us know that. We understand that. How many times have we said something we regret? How many times have we wanted to find a way to catch some words and just pull them back and not have said them? How many friendships have been destroyed just with words? Or maybe not destroyed, but wounded, broken. How many marriages, relationships have been torn apart with words. That's one of the things within a marriage that we find, that I find also in, often in counseling people over the years and marriages and that. One of the problems with, and I'm not saying there's a problem with marriage, but one of the dangers is that in marriage you get to know each other too well. You know, when you live with somebody, you you know more about them than, than you wanted to, really, probably. <laughs> but you know what a danger in that is? 
then we know how to hurt each other. We, we know what words, right? You, we talked about, you, you know their buttons, like what buttons to push to rile them up. And really, how many marriages have ended in divorce because of words, cruel words? How many children have said something cruel to their parents to, to hurt their parents? I, I, we, the tongue is an unruly evil. It's set on fire of health. We can destroy things with our tongue. And that's what James is kind of driving at. This is his point, that the tongue is so small. And then he gives the example. Think about that, beast and, and things in nature. How many giant animals have we as humans kind of domesticated? We've trained them. We were talking earlier about these uh, different amusement parks in Florida, and I mentioned SeaWorld. SeaWorld is a kind of like a giant aquarium it's part zoo, part aquarium. They have like dolphin shows and that, but they also have these shows with the uh, killer whales. We've trained killer whales. I mean, those things are big. I don't know if you've ever been close to one. I, I went to SeaWorld a couple of times when I was uh, growing up, and we went to the killer whale show, and for whatever reason, it's always great to sit in the splash section where the nasty water, where the fish and whales are, is splashing on you, but as kids, you loved it, and, you know, I mean, I'm, sure, I'm not sure how healthy it was to sit in the whale splash section, but okay. But they train those whales to splash people and to jump and then, but when you get up close to those things, they're humongous. And yet the trainer blows a whistle and the whale leaps a certain way, swims a certain way. Think about elephants, right? You go to a circus, you go to the zoo, they're trained elephants. Even lions. I mean, I think the people that train lions are crazy, but they do it. You know, I, I've seen, maybe you've seen somebody go and they put their head in the lion's mouth. Like, oh, he's such a good boy. I've trained him so well. I can put my head in his mouth. Again, I think these people have something wrong with them. I don't want to get in the cage. I don't care how trained the lion is. No, thank you. But at the same time, right, we've trained them. Horses, elephants, lions, tigers, bears, oh my, you know. And yet think about our tongue. Do you know anyone? Who has absolute and total control over their tongue? I don't. I, I put me in that list. I don't have control over my tongue. All I have to do is get a little tired, stressed out, frustrated. Get a little angry about something. And I'm going to say something dumb. James says the tongue can no man tame. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Solomon said a fool is known by the multitude of his words. That's why Solomon said Let, let's be, you know, when we go into the house of God, Let's be ready to hear more than we're ready to give the sacrifice of fools to speak. James himself says in James chapter 1, I believe it is, verse 19, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak.
slow to wrath. I find it interesting that James kind of puts the two together. Why? Because anger within our heart very quickly can lead to stupidity from our mouth. James continues in James chapter 3, Therewith bless we God, verse 9, Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeded blessing and cursing my brethren. These things ought not so to be. Doth the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either of vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh? Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. I don't know if you guys had this phrase in the UK, but uh, often in the US you would hear this statement. Kiss your mother with that mouth? Usually after somebody would swear. What was the idea? How can you speak sweet words and bitter words out of the same mouth? So having all this in mind then, what are we to do? I mean, James says we can't tame it. Should we just give up? Oh, well. I mean, there's a lot of people that do that. Well, you know, I've always swore. It's just how it is. It's, it's my character. Yeah, I just can't help it. I mean, hey, Bible says ain't no man can tame his mouth. I don't know why I have a southern accent and all of a sudden I apologize. It just felt very hillbillyish to say something. Can't control my mouth. James tells me there's no man. The, the man that control it, can, can control his tongue is a perfect man. Well, there's no perfect man, and I'm not perfect, so okay. But if we put it all together with what Solomon says to us, number one, let's be slow to speak. I mean, one surefire way to keep from saying something stupid is to just not talk. And I'm not saying we should all walk around mute. But we probably do, well, with the exception of grace, we probably do talk more than we should. We are swift to speak and slow to hear often. But the Bible says we should be the other way around. But I want to look at one other text, Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Because again, this goes to, so what do we do? Luke chapter 6, starting in um, verse 43. Here we have Jesus speaking. Luke chapter 6, verse number 43. For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. So we see a connection kind of even to what James was talking about there, right? Can a fountain bring forth sweet water and bitter? Can a fig tree bring forth berries and that? Same idea here. A good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by his own fruit. For of thorns do men gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. What is the solution? Getting our heart right. You know, a good way to know what's in our heart, because the Bible tells us in the book of Jeremiah, and in other places, but Jeremiah makes it very clear, uh, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? In other words, the Bible tells us that our heart will try to deceive us. Right? The world says, 
follow your heart? The Bible says absolutely not. Because our heart will deceive us. And honestly, we deceive ourselves very often. We think we are better than we are. It's kind of a human condition. Uh, there's a, you know, if you, you can research this, a thing called the Dunning, uh, Dunning-Kruger effect or Dunning-Kruger effect. The, um, what it is, it, it said that less competent people think they're more competent than they are. If you really want to see the Dunning-Kruger effect at play, uh, watch this, uh, like, uh, those singing talent shows. Like the voice, or, or not the voice, maybe the, one of the other ones that there was. Um, I'm trying to think what the name of it was that Simon guy from X Factor. Is X Factor, yeah, and some of these others. You have people that come on there and they're absolutely awful. Uh, American Idol was the big one. That's what I was trying to think of. And then I think they had Britain Idol or whatever. I mean, it, it spread around, but it was only singing. And some of the best television or best youtube if you want to watch are the rejects that didn't make american idol but how many of them said i just know i've got it i mean i am one of the best singers i know and then you hear them sing and you think to yourself why how did you ever get the idea that you could sing who told you, aside from your mother, that you can sing? But it doesn't just apply there, right? There's a lot of people who believe they're experts in things and don't have knowledge. They don't have enough knowledge to know that they're not experts. I remember when I was in university, and I when I began university studies, I was um, double majoring uh, I actually was planning to semi-triple major in mathematics, physics, and computer science. All very related fields. And I remembered in the physics lecture we were having, and it was, you know, we were new in the university, and one of the professors said, here's how your physics education will go. You will finish your first four years and get your bachelor degree, and you will look at this physics textbook and you will go, I can solve many of the problems that are given in the textbook. And then you will go on and you will get your master's degree in physics and you will say, yes, now I can solve every problem in that book. He said, and then you're going to work on your doctorates. And when you finish this, you will say, I don't even know what the problems are that need to be solved. He said, because the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. What does all that have to do with our heart? Well, our heart is deceitful above all things, and our heart tells us that we're okay. Our heart will tell us that we are good. Our heart will tell us, I'm not as bad as that guy. Right? We'll say, I'm not perfect, but I'm no Hitler. I mean, great. I'm glad you're not Hitler. You know, there was some talk show in the U.S. years ago, and some lady called in, and it became kind of a, like a viral thing. She called into the show, and she said, you know, I love Jesus, but I drink a little. And I, whenever I hear that, like, you know, I'm not perfect, but I'm not, all I can think is, you know, I love Jesus, but I drink a little. But, and she sounded like she was half drunk when she was on the phone. I don't even remember what the rest of the call was, because I think I only heard that clip, you know. I love Jesus, but I drink a little. I'm not perfect, but I'm not. But isn't that what our heart tells us? Our heart tells us you're okay. But here in Luke chapter 6, what does Jesus say? Out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaking. If we want to know what's really in our heart, we have to examine what we say. What do we talk about? What is our focus? 
And this is something the Lord really spoke to my heart about many years ago. I was at a youth camp. I had taken our teenagers from the church to camp and uh, acting as a counselor for the boys and all of that. And, and there was a man preaching. He preached about this text. And he, he said this. He said, I, I want you, you know, he's talking to the young people. But of course, it applied to me too. So when you go home, I want you to think about what you're known for. Like, what do people know you're going to talk about? When you have a conversation with somebody, what's the main topic of conversation? He said, because that is what is in your heart. Whatever the main topic of conversation is, that is what is in your heart. That is who you are. And that really spoke to me. I was in the process of a lot of changes in my life. The Lord had already made many changes. And it was shortly after that, I uh, was back in Philadelphia. I think you were with me at the time. I think we were married by that time. And we were in Philadelphia, where my parents are. And we went up to the university that I graduated to visit some of the professors and things and I wanted to show her where I went to college. So we're at the university and we were in an office talking with, uh, it was actually a former classmate of mine was working on her master's degree and she was in the office where, where we were. And a young guy came in who had been, I think a first year student the year I graduated. And so it was a few years later, but he's still in the university. And he comes into that office. He didn't remember my name. What he remembered about me was a particular rock group that I had been obsessed with. And I, obsessed may not even be a strong enough word. I'm one of the only people I know of that in the United States had bumper stickers for this band. And not only did I have them, I had two so that they could be evenly spaced on the back of my car. And I measured to make sure they were evenly spaced on the back. I had t-shirts for them. And I thought, you know, it's very sad that while I had claimed to be a Christian while I was at that university, and I knew God, and I knew some things about the Bible, but I didn't live for God. And that young man, who I interacted with on a regular basis for at least a year, didn't remember my name, didn't remember anything else. What he remembered was the rock group I was obsessed. And my mind went back to this. Because my tongue showed what was in my heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. It's true, no man can control the tongue. But you know, we can help ourselves by changing what's in our heart. See, if we fill ourselves with God's word, with godly things, then that's what will come out. Fill yourself with profanity, what's going to come out? Profanity. Fill yourself with things of this world, what's going to come out of your mouth? Things of this world. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And a good way to know where our heart is, is to, to look, to examine our conversation. Examine what we talk about. Examine what our, our loves are, if you will. You know, that's where our heart is. Let's close with prayer. Father, thank you, Lord, for your word today. Lord, in the message, we'd use these things to help us, Lord, that we would be drawn ever closer to you, Lord. Help us to guard our hearts, Lord, and Father, to be wise in the things that we speak, Lord. Father, to be slow to speak and swift to hear, Lord. 
Father, help us to examine our hearts, Lord, to know what our conversation is, Lord. Father, we, we know, Lord, that the heart is deceitful above all things, Lord. And, Father, we can't really know our heart, but, Lord, as we examine our conversation, we get a good idea of where our heart is, Lord. And, Father, would you help us to have hearts that are tuned with you, Lord, tuned towards you. Father, to, to draw after you, Lord, to seek after you, to seek after your truth. Lord, help us, Father, to control our tongues, and we ask all these things now in Christ's name.